Yeah, so I think we are live. So hi, everyone. Uh, in fact, uh, it's pretty interesting uh, chapter today because we have another summer uh, on call today with us. And uh, it's not a very common name. That's what I've heard. We're discussing, uh, you know, that only. And so 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 we have Summer Singh Shekhawat uh, today. And uh, he has uh, been CMO of uh, United Breweries, which is, I guess you all know United Breweries. If not, uh, you know, Kingfisher is one of their most popular brand. So, so welcome, Summer. Uh, Thank you. You know, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, you know, to get things started? Well, I was born, I belong to Rajasthan, but I was born and brought up in Assam in the tea gardens because my father was a tea planter who joined tea in 1957 and he was the third Indian to join tea. So I grew up in the tea gardens, you know, very macho, sporty outdoor life. And mm -hmm. then we sort of moved to Delhi. I moved with my brother to Delhi to pursue my education. So we studied in Delhi, in Delhi Public School, uh, RK Puram and Mathra Road. And then I did my college from Delhi University. I did e economics honors from Karorimal College, which is Amitabh Bachchan's college. It was famous uh, for being Amitabh Bachchan's college. And uh, then I went back to Assam and worked for a year in the tea gardens. Uh, and I realized that life as an assistant manager was very different from the life of the son of the manager. And mm -hmm. I sort of realized that that's perhaps not for me. And tea was changing in any case. So I came back and did my MBA. Um, and I got into IIM Ahmedabad in the agricultural MBA program, but I didn't take that up. I got into Irma and then I got into symbiosis as well. And I did my MBA in marketing and finance from symbiosis. And since then, I've been on, in the corporate world. I've worked for 32 years with, uh, started with Cadbury. Then I went to Unilever. Then I worked with Energizer batteries. And from there, I went to Dabur. Uh, from there, I went to PepsiCo, uh, then Spencer's Retail. Uh, and then finally, my last assignment was uh, at United Breweries, where I was a CMO for nine uh, years. Basically, I'm very fond of saying that I was Vijay Malia's slave for nine years. And one day I can write a book about my experiences of working with him. But yes, it's been a tremendous journey. And I quit my job about two years ago. And I'm now an independent business consultant. I founded a business transformation company that works with listed Indian businesses. Uh, I've also founded a marketing services company that basically deals in dairy products and trading. I also continue to do Alcobev consulting for private equity, venture capital, hedge funds. Uh, I do a lot of startup advisory, uh, you know, uh, across uh, across sort of businesses and sectors. And I've also associated with a couple of business diagnostics companies, uh, a communications company. Uh, and I do a lot of work with academia, uh, you know, for pro bono. I do leadership lessons. Uh, with companies. Uh, I do marketing workshops, business strategy, uh, sort of interventions. I, I'm also a professional public speaker. So I work with all the industry chambers, etc. So far, far busier than I was when I was working. Uh, and really yeah. a much, a much uh, working for someone else and, and a much wider sort of cross section of industries, you know, Indian businesses, multinationals. Uh, you know, I've been blessed to have worked with American, British, Dutch, Indian companies. I've worked in both steady state and startup businesses. I've worked in uh, all over India. I've lived in Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Madras, Calcutta. I've worked in the United States, in Western Europe, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. So multicultural, multi-locational, multi-industry experience. Uh, also, I was thrown into leadership at a very young age in my life. You know, I've grown up with people in the family who have had a lot of influence on in my life. My father's older brother, uh, uncle, was chief of naval staff, Admiral V.S. Shakawat. Uh, my father was, uh, you know, a general manager of the largest gardens. I think he's also named after him, maybe? No, he's, uh, we've got, you know, we are Rajputs, as you know, so we're three generations in the armed forces. My grandfather uh, fought for the yeah. British in the Second World War. Uncle was chief of naval staff. 
And my uncle's son, my first cousin, he was also in the Navy, Naval Aviator. He's now a commercial pilot with Indigo. So, and you know, we've grown up with a very, we've grown up with leaders around the house. My father-in-law was Chief Secretary, Himachal Pradesh government. My mother's brother, first cousin was Raju Mama, who was, or Raju Bhaiya, as we call him, Professor Rajendra Singh was the Sarsan Chalak of the RSS, handpicked by Bala Sahib Deoras. And till today remains the only non-Maharashtrian, non-Brahman to ever become Sarasan Chalak at the RSS. Uh, P.P. Singh, the former prime minister, is my mother's second cousin. Um, my father was, you know, heading the largest garden for Andrew Yule, uh, which is a tea company owned by the British at a very young age. So I've sort of grown up with leadership around me. So I've learned a lot from them. And uh, I also got thrown into leadership positions very early in my life. You know, at the age of 24, I was the youngest area manager in the history of Cadbury's. And I had three factories, ice cream factories, we know we launched dollops ice cream, three ice cream factories, two and a half states, and 50 year old people reporting into me. I mean, my father was younger than the people that were reporting into me. So it was, you know, you need to grow up really fast. And I was blessed well, that I had the opportunity. Very, very impressive indeed. And for Thank everybody's you. knowledge, you guys, this is the reason why we brought him in because marketing is constantly one of the issues that you know customers partners almost everybody's clueless about right and uh, and you know so we thought why not have somebody who can like just you know dispel some myths around marketing and then maybe just talk about marketing so so you know so summer just tell us a little bit about like what's your i mean i know it's a very very vast field but let's say cmo of a public company what's what's your role like what's your day looks like and what's the you know how does a day look like for a CMO of a public company? I think that's a great question. You know, I think the CMO is perhaps the highest pressure job, apart from, of course, the CEO of the company in any organization today. Uh, mm -hmm. And really, I think the role has evolved from just being a chief marketing officer to really something called CGO, which is chief growth officer, yeah. because the person has to work with sales, with marketing, with finance, commercial, with procurement, with supply chain with HR, with governance. And I'm very fond of saying that marketing is the only function in the organization that is outward looking. You know, yeah. you're the interface between the brand and your the, 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 the products and services and your company and the outside world. Typically, finance is an inward looking function. You know, production or, you know, HR is an inward looking function. You, your interface with the outside world is hiring people and then growing them and developing them. Procurement is dealing with vendors and, you know, buying products and, you know, doing a great job of that. But And sales, of course, is dealing with your channels, but you don't read, deal typically in most businesses directly with the customer. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but marketing yeah. is really always putting the messaging and you're, you're the voice of the customer or the consumer in the boardroom. So that is number one. Number two, you're responsible. I mean, you and the team are responsible for actually not just spending money, you know, you're responsible for delivering growth for the brand, for the organization. Now, the growth could be in terms of revenue. It could be in terms of market share. It could be in terms of market capitalization. It could be in terms of brand health indicators. It could be in terms of, you know, new consumers garnered, etc. But it's always taking the money that is earned by the sales team and allocating it in such a way that it is best serves the organization's interests in terms of the outside world. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, I think the environment has become far more complex than it ever was. Uh, I think technology has disrupted the marketing officers or the chief CMO's job more than almost any other function uh, in, the in, in the corporate world, you know, from, from media choices to the way consumers behave, to the way that the, the fact that there are many Indias, there is no one India. Millennials, in any case, have completely different motivations. You know, they value, for instance, experiences over possessions. They will only buy brands that have a purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. Then there are many other, you know, micro trends or mega trends, you, you know, depending on how you want to look at them. There is a tremendous sense of pride in India and Indian achievements. Uh, there is a sense of coming back to your roots and, and, you know, nationalism. At the same time, there's a new confident India that is ready to take on the world. Uh, and I'm fond of saying that Indians may read and write in English, but they think in vernacular. 
and they speak yes. in the vernacular. So to give an example, if I were watching an Avengers movie in Barcelona or in Madrid, why is it unreasonable to expect people in the interval to be speaking anything other than uh, you know, Spanish or Catalan or Basque, depending on which region you are? Now, I live in Bangalore, so I, I go to see an Avengers movie in English. And during the interval, everyone around me is speaking in Kannada or maybe Tamil. So that's their first. They think in the vernacular. They speak in the vernacular. They may read and write in English. And as a marketer, yeah. you know, there's also tremendous diversity in this country, Samar. I mean, we have diversity of, of geography, of climate, of scripts, of languages, uh, of cuisine, of festivals, social sort of uh, customs and tradition. There's just so many different countries. I keep saying that managing India is like managing the European Union without Brexit. You know, so it's a complex nation than technology, technological disruption, you know, far greater choice for younger consumers today than in our time. And really, the ground changes an inch every day. And you may yeah. not notice that one inch, but after 12 days, you suddenly notice that it has moved one foot. So it's it's I really the way. Yeah. My CMO just messaged me that, you know, this is a very good speaker privately. <laughs> <laughs> you Thank know. you. Uh, what, I'm fond of, yeah, what I'm fond of saying is uh, that the CMO's feet are the ones that are closest to the fire. And yeah. frankly, the CMO is the first guy to get sacked if things go wrong. The global average tenure of a CMO is four years. I was there for nine years. So, you know, I either, either they didn't find anyone you know, uh, better than me to do the job or, or cheaper than me to do the job. Or, you know, maybe I didn't I mess up too badly. Bad. Maybe so. I didn't mess up too, too, too badly. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's an extremely high pressure job today. You know, you need to look at data. You need to look at and you're in that business. You don't need to look at technology. You need to marry it with your own gut feel. And, and you, know, you know, what is gut feel? Summer? Gut feel is not something that you wake up in the morning and have a conversation with your daughter about. It's the repository of your entire work and life experience. So that is what your gut feel is. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a big one for being right-brained as well as left-brained, a judicious combination of, you know, data as well as uh, marrying it with with your own intuition, with your own uh, experiences, and uh, also looking at the reality on the ground. And you must be ready to change your mind all the time. Yeah. You know, Mahatma Gandhi said that only a fool doesn't change his mind. So, because you know, alternative facts are presenting themselves all the time. I mean, who could have thought that TikTok would you know, have 600 million subscribers and I know you're going to talk about a little later in the conversation, but why hasn't anyone already launched an Indian version? I, I know four or five people are already working on it. But, you know, so those are the, I mean, there's no easy answer and it's a great, uh, it's a great question. So, so, so some are moving on to like, you know, more audience uh, specific thing, which is, uh, so most of our people are either entrepreneurs who are watching are entrepreneurs or who want to be entrepreneurs at some point, right? I say, like every employee we have in the company, you know, they are typically saying that, uh, you know, they'll eventually want to be entrepreneurs, right? That's, that's right. what we want to want. And a lot of them are there like that. So, uh, and their biggest question generally, most common question is how do I market as a startup without much budget? So, you know, is there an answer to that or is there no answer to that? So, you know, um, about a year ago, I was speaking at uh, a Kalari Capital event uh, at mm -hmm. their uh, co-working space. I think it's called K-Start in, uh, yeah. in, White, in Whitefield. And yeah. the room was full of about 150 startup entrepreneurs. And they, they got me to speak last because they knew that I would say something controversial, which means I would speak the truth. So I started my, state, my, my, my talk by saying, you know, it's very easy to build a business on someone else's money. <laughs> and there was silence in the room and then everyone started laughing and applauding. I said, you know, you may, you may feel offended about it, but that's the truth. Throughout my life, Samar, I have launched new brands for large companies. When I started my career, uh, I launched Dollops ice cream for Cadbury's. Then I launched Walls ice cream for Unilever. I launched Energizer batteries in this country. Then I went to Pepsi and I launched Tropicana. I launched Gatorade. I launched Aquafina. I launched Pepsi Blue, Mountain Dew. You know, then came to, uh, sorry, even before that with Dabur, I started a completely new natural products division 
from scratch. You may have heard of brands like Sanova, Spirulina, etc. Uh, from yeah. there, I went to Spencer's Retail, started the entire business from scratch. And at UB, all the new brands that you see were all launched during my time, from Kingfisher Ultra to Ultra Max to Blue to Red to Kingfisher Storm to Kingfisher Draft to Heineken, Amstel, everything. So I have experience of launching new brands throughout my life. And we never had access to institutional funding. There was no question of asking angel investors, private equity, or venture capital for money. So this fancy term of being bootstrapped or a bootstrap shoestring budget, that's all we have known all our lives. There just is a fancy term for it now. Uh, that wrong. Yeah, that's true. So I think it is eminently possible to launch a brand uh, without initial seed money. But of course, at, at an appropriate time, depending on your scale, uh, your ambition and your capability and your ability to, to convince uh, funders, uh, you know, you would require that. But I also want to si strike a note of caution, you know, for people like us, who's seen, I'm now in my fourth decade in, uh, you know, in, in business, I'm 32 years, so I've entered my fourth decade. You know, we see things going in cycles from mm -hmm. advertising agency that were full service agencies to breaking up to coming back as full service to again going specialist and now again coming back, you know, things like the internet.com meltdown of 2000, you know, of 2000 then the banking crisis of 2008 and so on and so forth. Um, we are seeing today, you know, COVID sort of uh, related disruptions, but anyone's business in been in business for long enough, this too shall pass. And today funding may be, uh, you know, tighter than it ever was, but frankly, that's the only world we've known. And I think there's a lot of sentiment that drives this. Is Baiju's worth 10 billion? Who can tell? I really don't know. You know, this whole thing about unity economics and future stream of income, et cetera. The thing about Indians is that we are a very optimistic people. We always believe that today is better than yesterday and tomorrow will be better than today. That's the whole philosophy of this nation. And that, and thank God for that philosophy. We plan for the future. We plan for our children. We plan for our old age. We plan for our parents' old age. So I think some of that rubs off into funding as well. Frankly, I think funding has been far too easy to come by. Because, you know, today, and 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 we, I mean no disrespect, he's a lovely guy, but if I see Ritesh Agarwal's whole business model, and if I look at Oyo Rooms, I've stayed in Oyo Rooms, it's, and I think I was one of the lone dissenting voices that said, he's just growing too fast too soon. This is not going to sustain. Uh, because we've, we've been there, Summer, we've done that so many times. So, you know, it's also, you're not building the foundation for a business, you know, it, it takes much longer. It takes far more diligence. And the, the, the issue is that a lot of these entrepreneurs are very young, young boys and girls. Yeah. And they may not necessarily have the life skills. Forget about business skills. I mean, I just finished reading a book, which I'm sure you've read it. If you haven't, you must. It's a book called Big Billion Startup. It's about the Flipkart story written by a friend of mine called Mehid Dalal. Astoundingly well-researched. And if you look at Sachin and Benny Bansal, I mean, at the end of the day, for someone like me, they're bachas, right? So they, they, they have, there's a certain stage in your life that you haven't yet reached. And if you're successful as a startup, what happens is that you start facing problems at the age of 28, 30 that you would face when you were 45 years old. So you, you, you don't have the life skills to handle that situation. Today, if you show me a business model, I can tell you whether it's going to work or not. If you show me an organization structure and you show me the people that, are actually part of that organization structure by talking to people for five minutes. I can tell you whether this person is suited for that function or not, be simply because we've done it thousands of times uh, prior. So, and I find my single biggest challenge summer with advising startups is that if you have never heard, if I'm Virat Kohli and you've never heard of the game of cricket, yeah. how do I tell, how do I tell you what I am? I, I, I can't, I can't, so the, the example, you may, you may laugh, but the example I use with people is, let's assume you're 27, 28 years old. Are you, are you married? No, sir. Do you have a girlfriend? No, sir. Or I said, okay, let's imagine tomorrow you fall in love and get married to a 40-year-old woman who has a 16, 17-year-old son from a previous marriage. Now, overnight, you go from being a 27, 28-year-old bachelor to a father of an 18-year-old son 
and the husband of a wife who's who was 28 12 years ago how are you going to run your life because nothing in your background your breeding your upbringing your education has prepared you for this so when i tell them this i said now take this into business if you're successful you're facing problems at the age of 28 that you would typically face at 40. so hire people like us who can be your guide and mentor and advisor and you know tell you you know how to run those things but yes i think it is eminently possible to build a business on 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 sort of small fronts my only singular advice to all the startup people focus on value not on valuation if you focus on value yeah if you focus on yeah please use it for if you focus on value summer valuation will come yeah. Focus on building the best possible product, delivering the best possible service time after time after time. The valuation will come. Yeah. You focus on valuation, you start compromising on everything else. You compromise on your business model. You compromise on your employees. You're rushing to touch your investors' feet. I've had startup, I've had startup clients walk out of meetings because the investor just landed in Bangalore. I see. Yeah, but the guy's like three hours away. You can, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's that's my answer. I think you know. I think that's very true. You know, and there's so many. In fact, COVID has uh, exposed so many business models which are completely frivolous. I mean, you know, like they didn't make sense, and uh, you know, almost every company, every mature company was able to figure it out, right? I mean, if you look at sure. all the bigger brands. They because they had cash flows, they understood, you know, that this is just a cycle. But startups who had like literally losses, they are not sure, you know, if they should burn more money to get more traction or to conserve capital and go to zero or something like that. So, yeah, because they've never faced this situation before. Yeah, well, exactly. the bigger brands have faced it maybe seven or eight but, times in their lives. Now, and I, just before you move on, I just want to say one more thing, which a lot of people will find controversial. If you're a success, I can, I get it. If you're an MSME, you know, I have at least 20 friends of mine who've been in, who run MSMEs for the last 20, 25 years. And they say, mm -hmm. boss, we're having to shut down our business because we simply don't have the margins to continue to pay salaries, rent, electricity costs with three or four months of no revenue coming in. And I said, I get it. I understand. But put your hand on your heart and tell me that you've not taken money out of the business to buy your fancy houses in Jorbag, to buy those Bottega Veneta bags for your for your for your wives, to take those fancy holidays in the United States or Western Europe. You've taken money out of the system as well. Yeah. And today there, if you know you've you've in you've taken so 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 it's partly as my mother would say, Thori to Mia Bhavre, Thori Pili Bhang. You know, it's 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 Yes, it is a situation that is unprecedented, but you've also taken money out of the system. So it's you made your bed, now you lie in it. That, that's, that's point uh, number one. Uh, number two, I think, you know, today's compressed life cycles. You, you, you look at funded startups today. You know, Zomato has laid off 30% of their workforce. Swiggy yeah. has laid off 15% of their workforce. Um, Oyo has sacked thousands and thousands of people in, in China, America, and India. And by the way, these numbers are only people on their roles. These are not yeah. off-roll people whose contracts have been cancelled. Yeah. My question is this is simple. Where are all those billions of dollars of funding that you raised for people, technology, and processes? Where's all that money gone? Technically, yeah. you can continue to pay their salaries for the next 100 years. Forget about four months. But nobody seems to be in a mood to do that. I mean, and that's really that's that's what yeah. capitalism is all about. Yeah. So, so summer, let's let's talk about the the current topic, right? I mean, uh, yeah. India has banned a lot of uh, Chinese apps, and you know, there's a. So, what do you think should be should be the approach of Indian entrepreneurs towards that? Should they jump in and start building for that? The vacuum left there. Should they, because, you know, do you think it is going to be permanent? Like, what would your advice be? Because a lot of people are thinking, okay, there's this like big TikTok vacuum, you know? And uh, so my question is, why won't Instagram be the next TikTok and stuff like that? So what's your advice to them? So if I were Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn or whoever, I mean, I would have been thinking about that in any case, regardless of whether TikTok gets banned or not. I mean, you should have thought that 
you know, maybe yeah. there is, I think TikTok's single greatest success is that it has been able to tap into the aspirations of smaller town youth. Uh, yeah. Everyone aspires to be famous. Everyone aspires to present himself or herself as younger, cooler, smarter, fitter, more talented than they really are in real life. And I think it's a platform that gave vent to those aspirations. Um, why hasn't anyone else thought of it earlier on? Why did it take a Chinese origin company uh, or a Chinese owned company to come back and understand our consumer better than we do? So yeah. the, the question I would encourage the marketing and startup ecosystem is to, to ask that first. So that's number one. Number two, you know, frankly, if you look at it, I mean, when I saw the list of apps that have been banned, I was actually familiar with only two or three, TikTok, and I happened to use UC browser. By the way, it's still working. So I don't know when the ban comes into effect. Uh, I think there's one app called Shine, which my daughter uses. So she was sort of, yeah. you know, asking me about that. But most of the other apps, frankly, I hadn't used. But then I'm not the relevant target audience. You know, someone like you would know a lot of that. And I'm not getting into the politics of whether it's the right thing to do and whether it should have been banned. Also, remember, the ban is temporary until they can actually show to the yeah. government that data that is, is safe, it's not going to China, and so on and so forth. Also, these guys are all paying money into the PM Cares Fund and all sorts of other stuff as well, right? Uh, I think the reason why this ban has happened is because either directly or indirectly, the PLA, the you know, in, in actually senior senior members of the of the of the Communist Party uh, actually have personal stake, personal business stake in in a lot of these businesses, either directly or indirectly, and they are hoping that. Only, I mean, a combination of perhaps military, diplomatic, and economic action is what is going to hurt uh, the Chinese. Uh, and yeah. I believe the Chinese have raised serious concerns about that matter. So, I would, what I would ask the Indian ecosystem to do is, first of all, these are not the only apps in the in in this business. There are already smaller apps that that are there, and do not take for a minute for granted that these ba the apps are banned forever. Mm -hmm. I don't think, personally, I don't think that's going to happen. There is just simply yeah. too much revenue to be made by everyone tomorrow. If I, And I know the number two a childhood friend of mine, you know, who's head of uh, Bite Dance in India, to, uh, you know, and in fact, I want to ask him what, what's, what's happening with you. But tomorrow they can meet the government. They can make presentations to the prime minister's office, to the in industries minister, commerce ministry, etc. And they can reassure the government that your data is, I mean, tomorrow I can say, man, you know what, I'll locate all my servers in your geography, in your geographical country. You have, so localization of servers, localization of data, you control it. I will prove to you that nothing is going to China. Yeah. Then and if they, do yeah. That, if they do that, then the, then the government has no option but to uh, rethink uh, the rules under which you ban these apps. Uh, yeah. I, would, I, would, I would advise entrepreneurs not to just simply rush in because these apps have been banned. And I always say never react to competition, react to consumers if consumers are reacting to competition. So if you believe, yeah, if, if you believe that there is an opportunity to have a platform that enables largely smaller town youth, largely, I'm saying it's not, I mean, I know yeah. even actors, even, even movie stars are on TikTok, to, to give vent to, to, to their theatrical and creative talents, etc. by all means, go and do it. Uh, and I think the advantage in a way is that, you know, China was initially known to copy and produce cheaper almost anything in the world. Yeah. Here's a ready-made business, here's a ready-made business uh, model for you and technology. It's easy to sort of uh, replicate that in the Indian context. But I'm saying you should have been thinking about it even before these apps had got banned. Exactly. No, makes sense. So, makes a lot of sense. So, you know, the message for everybody is don't think of this as a big opportunity, think fundamentally. If you think there is an opportunity just in case, get into it, not because there's a ban. And I completely agree with it. And so, so Summer, let's let's jump into some questions. You know, there's already a few questions uh, for you. You know, so I don't also want to take a lot of time. And uh, because, uh, you know, with marketing, this is a topic that uh, people will just ask a lot of questions. So, so first question is from Jagreet Aroda. He's asking, uh, why is brand positioning uh, important in on-demand businesses? So on-demand businesses are like, you know, Zomato, Swiggy, uh, like app businesses where you press a button, some 
something comes and stuff yeah. Like that. yeah. See, I think uh, it's not as if brand positioning is not important in other businesses, and the rules that apply to business, you know, across across industries, across geographies, etc., apply in the on-demand business as well. There are certain specific challenges in the on-demand business uh, that you know make it even more important. But essentially, I, the one what I like saying is that there are five rules for branding. Uh, number one is clarity. Who are you? What do you do? Do you solve a real or perceived human pain point? Do you improve their lives? I mean, why are you in existence? What is your purpose? So there has to be clarity of the business model, clarity of the messaging, clarity also who you are not. What is it that you will not do? So, you know, we used to have these architecture model that who I am, who I'm not, what I will do, what I will not do. And you can use the levers pyramid. You can use the diamond architect. There's, there's just so many different models. But the number yeah. one is clarity. And in that also, I think every brand has to answer three questions in that clarity. Who am I? What do I do? And most brands stop there somewhere. The truly great brands answer a third question, which is how do I change your life? Yeah. You know, so who am I? What do I do? And how do I change your life? And you will notice that most people fail in that in terms of how do I change your life? Right. So, so, so the first one is clarity. The second one is relevance. Are you relevant for today's time? Now, for instance, if you're a wristwatch, if you're a luxury wristwatch brand today, first of all, youngsters don't wear, millennials simply are not buying watches anymore. Because as a timekeeping device, the mobile phone is far more effective, far more flexible, and so on and so forth. So I think watches for men today are the perhaps the only acceptable form of male jewelry. At the end of the day, the world's largest selling watch is the Apple Watch. Last year, Apple sold 31 million watches globally, all the other branded Swiss watch in the, yeah, there you go. The Swiss watch industry put together sold 21 million watches. So it would have been unthinkable even three or four years ago. So relevance, something that worked for you in the past may not work for you today. Uh, past success is no guarantee of future success. So the first one is clarity. The second one is relevance. I mean, is it relevant? Is it tech? See, technology, and I know you're a tech technology company, Summer. Technology is of no use if it has no application. Technology is not a means by itself. It's a means to an end. It needs to have an application. So second one is relevant. The third one is differentiation. How am I different from someone else? Why should I, why should I talk to Samar Singh Shekhawat and not to someone else? What is it that you bring to the table that no one else brings? And now you may not be completely different. Maybe you are cheaper. Maybe you are faster. Maybe you are smaller. Maybe you're addressing a, a white space that is not there in the current uh, uh, competitive set. So differentiation. The fourth one in the Indian context, very important, is presence. You see a lot of goods and services in this country get sold by the sheer physical fact of availability. Yeah. So, so presence. And the last one is engagement. You know, at the touch point, what is the moment of truth is when, or as the Americans say, where the rubber meets the road, what is the engagement? Because today, if I have a bad experience with Amazon, I will give Jeff Bezos to Gali Dunga. Yeah. You know, yeah. so, uh, so, that's, so that's really what it is. So clarity, relevance, differentiate, differentiation, presence, and engagement. Specifically on the on-demand business, I think it's, it's, it's at hyper speed. So typically what happens is, you're, you know, I'm very fond of saying that customer loyalty is a leaky bucket. Every day, you will lose consumers and customers. The aim is to add new customers at a rate that is higher than the rate at which you're losing. That's the way you'll have net incremental customers. I think one big challenge with the on-demand business is that there is instant consumer loyalty and instant consumer indifference and instant consumer you know, action. I mean, I can in uninstall the app, right? If I were to stop buying Lux soap, it'll still take me two or three months to stop doing that. It's probable that I have four or five soaps lying with me. But I'll finish yeah. that first. But here, I can uninstall you immediately. I can write right. a review. I can I can follow you know uh, Jack Dorsey on Twitter and you know tag him in a message. I mean, so they're just you know two way communication, reaching the top of you know, of of the chain immediately, instant satisfaction, instant dissatisfaction. I mean, those are some of the challenges that exist, uh, and that is why brand positioning is even more important in the on demand business. Yeah, makes sense. So, so, you know, so moving on to the next question, I mean, you know, Wilfred is thanking you and uh, then there is Akhil who's asking, uh, uh, you know, a question. Uh, so a lot of 
small businesses sprung up uh, for grocery delivery you know food delivery etc during the covid right globally a lot of them most of them failed i mean what what would you say you know what's uh, your take on that is is it uh, like why do you think it happened i'm not surprised it failed at all if you see a, a movie called gone with the wind or, or or you see read the book you know the red butler's character played by clark gable for so the youngsters will all go and google who is clark gable and what is gone with the wind but red butler yeah. says in that that there is always money to be made in the building and destruction of a nation slow money in the building of a nation and quick money in the destruction in the destroying of a nation like i said to you the if you get so i know people who are in the apparel business who have shut down their apparel business and they're only manufacturing personal protective equipment they're making fast face masks they're making gloves they're making pps and so on and so forth now what happens to these people the day a vaccine for covid is discovered or approved it will take a year maybe two years it can't take forever i don't know i mean i'm i hope i'm 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 right on that because you know you know vaccines for everybody's hoping really so yeah 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 it is because you know if you think of it some malaria took some 20 years for chloroquine and hydrochloroquine etc to be to be discovered and used so you know fortunately medical science is far more advanced there are 120 global trials going on and so on and so for what will you do when this situation passes because it will pass you know i live in yeah. bangalore and 50% of the people are already out on the streets and no one's wearing masks uh so I mean, half of them are not wearing masks so if you are jumping into business because there is a narrow window of opportunity chronologically geographically it's not going to it's not going to work you know there needs to be a fundamental business the rules of business i mean i is there a relevance is it a long term opportunity uh is do you think consumers will continue to buy this and so on and so forth see anyone who got into home delivery of fruits vegetables should understand that even today 10 years or 20 years after 25 years after organized retail has gotten to food and grocery the modern trade business is still contributes to only 5% of food and grocery business your and everyone talks to me about home delivery of alcobev it will impact only 1% of the industry so this is a very very small and there are many reasons you know digital payment gateways credit card penetration pos machines you know, internet speeds etc etc a lot of questions coming and sure sure to- sure Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. That's so, one question from Priya is: What name one strategy you adopted to make United Breweries so successful? Yeah, actually, I can see that question on my screen as well. I think there are, you know, I think UBL, uh, we made sure we are the largest manufacturing footprint. That's number one. We have thirty-one breweries, twenty-one of our own, ten contract breweries. So, wherever there is a state, literally, we had one brewery in every state. So, the sheer ability to manufacture. and 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 supply that's number one number two the distribution network we were available in 99.9% of all alcobev stores you know there are only 80000 stores selling alcohol in this country so that's number two number three i think very sharply defined brands uh, you know kingfisher is synonymous with beer uh, number four i think we had great marketing you know with our associations across sports fashion food music ipl formula 1 racing the calendar and so on and so forth at the end of the day boss you're not selling a life saving product you're selling a product that just gives happiness to people right you know beer so you need to create the occasions and you need to create uh, the, the the resolution uh, and you know a satisfactory happy resolution for that occasion and the last i think was a tenured organization you know most people at ub have worked there for 25 30 35 in some cases even 40 years so there was this whole historical perspective and soft skill that existed with the organization that really made it successful so manufacturing footprint distribution network sharply focused brands great marketing and a tenured organization makes sense so so next question is uh, how would you know that the uh, that this idea that you have is a good idea for a startup how do you basically test your ideas you know if you get well, an idea today yeah. i would tell arun to hire me and then i will tell him but uh, since he's asked me this question i don't i think you know depending on your age and you look like a young guy uh, if from your picture that i that uh, that is taking up you know you may not have the experience to handle all of it so you know bank and on on the advice of people you respect you know you must have uh, sort of mentors and you know guidance etc look at authentic sources of data talk to people who are subject matter experts you know you ha- don't don't trust things like whatsapp and stuff and don't and remember that everyone has an agenda right you know even if you go to a bcg or a bain or an accenture 
at the end of the day, they are consultants, so they will have an agenda. But most importantly, talk to your consumer. Whenever you're in doubt, just go talk to your consumer. That, and the consumer could be, is not your family. You know, that is, that's what's called cognitive bias. Go and talk to people that you don't know. So go and talk to people who you think will be the consumer for your, uh, you know, your, your, your product or your brand. That is the singular deciding factor. And don't go with confirmation bias. Talk to people who don't know you. Talk to people who are outside your ecosystem. You know, the problem, let's say, with advertising people, is they'll talk only to advertising people. Don't do that. Walk the streets. Talk to auto rickshaw drivers. Talk to someone drink, smoking a beedi. Talk to, you know, your security guard. Talk to, you know, the shopkeeper outside. Uh, talk to his son or her daughter, you know. So just talk to people who are different from the world that you inhabit. Talk to people who you believe are potential consumers for the product or service that you're, that you're uh, trying to offer. And then calibrate it. In India, things are never as good as they seem. Fortunately, yeah. they're also never, never as bad as they seem. That's very true. So, so this next one is a very interesting question from Nidan. So he's asking, how did you rebuild Kingfisher and UB after Vijay Malaya's debacle? I mean, how did it impact and what did you guys do? You know, if I could be given a dollar for every time I was asked that question, I would be a millionaire now. But uh, fortunately for us, you know, Vijay Malia's, uh, while he was representative and emblematic of the brand and business, uh, you know, I, I don't think people will stop drinking Kingfisher just because Vijay Malia is going through personal problems. I mean, I'll yeah. drink a beer if I like the beer. It's like Nike taking a stand with Colin Kaepernick. And if you don't know Nidan, who's Colin Kaepernick, you Google it. You know, uh, he was the man who took a knee, who stood, you know, during the U.S. national anthem being played and Trump got really angry and put, uh, you know, um, sort of called all the NFL heads in America and told them not to hire him. You think Nike really cares about Black Lives Matter and White Lives Matter and All Lives Matter? They don't. What, whatever personal views they have, this is a pure business decision. Remember that you're probably a young guy. Don't get fooled by brands taking stands and causes. They don't care about those stands and causes. It's a pure business decision. Nike had done complex market simulation modeling that proved to them that if they put Colin Kaepernick as their brand ambassador, a lot of the white boys will get polarized, but the entire black African-American fraternity will end up buying Nike shoes. You know, so my submission is don't buy Nike shoes because they stand for black rights. Buy them if you like the running shoes they make, because that's all they owe you. So, you know, that we, we just focused on the beer business. And, you know, you know, he, in any case, never interfered really with the running of the business. And, you know, yeah. professionals have run and run, run it all the time. That makes sense. So, so, you know, the next question is from Navjot. So he's basically asking, what do you think would be a good post pandemic business? You know, if like, do you see something being uh, Permanent. Listen, if you know, uh, my I'm a slightly contrarian view because when you've lived as long as I have and seen as much as I have, you know, you you believe this too shall pass. So I think personally, and I don't think anyone's going to tell this to you. I think work from home is going to destroy both work and home, if you ask me, because I've been working from home for the last two years. I did work out of a WeWork office for six or eight months, and it didn't work for me. In any case. We work went through lots of troubles and so so i've gone back to working from home but it's not as if you know i've had to now lock away my wife and daughter in two rooms so that they don't come behind the camera fortunately i don't have grown up young kids running around etc also while you're physically there you're not mentally there and yes people claim they're more productive but i know i mean people are getting mentally frustrated they're getting depressed uh they're seeking help they're seeking counseling I get calls every day, 40, 50, 20, 30 year old people crying on the phone because of mental stress. Someone's job has gone away. Kisi ki tankha kam ho gaye, kisi ko bonus nahi mila, kisi ka promotion increment, you know, chala gaya. And remember one thing, and uh, you know, Samar also has runs a large successful organization. You know, as CEOs, I would give you, I would advise you that do not fall prey to the evil HR agenda that is going on today because HR people are using this to feed off the fears of employees and doing all sorts of stuff. I know personal personal example. I'm not going to take those names. Uh, so this too shall pass six months, one year, two years. Your business should sustain prior to COVID, during COVID and post COVID. 
if you think that this opportunity will stay forever, I'm sorry, you're wrong. And if you think people will continue to work from home, that's also not going to happen. We just do. I mean, hundreds and thousands of years of human evolution do not change overnight. And the, there's just too much money riding on multiplexes, malls. I mean, malls have already opened, right? Liquor stores have opened. It's a, flights have started. Soon international flights will also start. We'll just have to learn to live with this and just be careful. And, uh, you know, business will sustain only if it was viable before COVID and will then uh, hopefully stay viable after COVID. So don't fall prey to small opportunistic opportunities. Be because if you want to do that, why don't you start heroin smuggling or cocaine smuggling, right? Tremendous returns, but there are massive risks as well. Yeah, it's true. So, so you know, next my my marketing team is actually asking, what is what are your thoughts on transition in uh, marketing, like from field to digital? Like it's like earlier there used to be a lot of field marketing, it's still there is, but uh, is that transitioning to digital first of all, or are they going to coexist? Yeah, I'm not sure whether the question is in terms of career prospects for a person who's in field marketing and moving to digital marketing, or is is the question more to do with uh, how brands? I think it's about the brands piece. Yeah, I hope so you know so. what the, the problem with life. Uh, whoever's asked this question from your team is that it is never an either or situation. It's always an and situation. You see, if I'm the coach of the Indian cricket team, do I say that, you know what, should I select Rohit Sharma or Virat Kohli? I can't choose. I have to have both. Of course, Rohit yeah. is much more, much more uh, consistent now than he used to be. But until three years ago, you know, you knew that Virat would give you 60 or 70 runs every time. Whereas Rohit will give you 0, 0, 0, 0, 200, 0, 0, 0, 200, 0, 0, 0, 200. Now you'll hope that today is the day where he gives you 200. Fortunately, he's become much more consistent now. So life is usually never either or. Either or decisions are easy to make. You will find you always have to make and decisions. I can't, I'll be hard pressed to think of a single brand that can do only field marketing or, or only digital marketing. You need to do everything because you need to touch the consumer in, in at every point of his or her life cycle. So the transition is the in the question transition. It means that you're going to stop doing one and move to the other. That's never going to happen. You have to do both field marketing and digital and brand everything. I told you clarity, uh, you know, relevance, differentiation, presence and engagement. The last two are presence and engagement. Present means you need to be present. Engaged means you need to be called, you know, uh, talking to your uh, consumer. And both digital and field do both of that. So, so next question is from Deeksha. So she's asking, you know, YouTube is launching uh, something called Shorts, similar to TikTok, yes. uh, looking at yes. the situation. So, do you think uh, they can uh, seize this opportunity, or do you think it's not going to work for them? See, the thing, the, I think the difference is that, again, you can't compare because at the end of the day, this is owned by YouTube, right? I'm not sure whether people can post their own videos on shorts or not, uh, because you need to you need to give the yeah, you need to give the power away to the consumer. Yeah. And then you have to run. You have to put a stone on your heart and you have to willing to, you have to be willing to run with the fact that you will see pornography on it. You will see maybe drug abuse on it. You will see maybe law, unlawful activities happening because, you know, the app is only a, re, a mirror or a reflection of what human beings are. You yeah. know, so, so so will YouTube compliance and governance policies and your privacy and security policies will probably uh, take care of a lot of that, which means by definition, it will not become as big. Uh, you know, yeah. free market is, is, is what really makes it big. Uh, and I think we are very poor at self-governing and self-disciplining ourselves. Um, so, so I don't think it can become as big as TikTok. I don't think TikTok thought they would become as big as they've become. Yeah, uh, that's true. But there is an opportunity, but I, I personally don't think it'll be as big as TikTok. Makes sense. So, you know, I think uh, let's make it the last question. I know you have to also go. Uh, so, Sahaj is asking, uh, you know, what? How does one crack B two C model, B two C business models without offering freebies or burning cash? Because in India today, it's like, you know, standard that if you need customers, if you need to market, like, okay, free food, free this, free that. Uh, Sahaj I want to ask you, are, is Zomato making money? Is, <laughs> like, is, 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 is Uber making money? Is Oyo making money? What is the, what is the purpose of business? At the end of the day, the purpose of business is deliver profit 
and returns to your stakeholders. Now, how yeah. long do you think Jack Ma or Alibaba or Tencent or whoever is investor or Tiger or TPG, whoever, how long do you think they will continue to fund these brands? Their, their valuations have already fallen. They can rise dramatically. They can fall dramatically. And also remember, Sahaj Beer, for every Zomato and Uber that, that you read about, there are a hundred others that fail that never even, you know, so it's it's like for every every Shah Rukh Khan, there will be thousands and thousands of people who wanted to become an actor and didn't make it. So remember, you read only about the ones that became successful. And despite burning so much cash, they're not making money. Look at Flipkart as the best example. You know, uh, Walmart bought Flipkart for some 16, 17 billion dollars. And it, since the time they've bought it, I think Flipkart has burned through another one and a half, two billion dollars and their losses have actually increased. Their losses are increasing at a rate that is higher than the revenue increase. That's yeah. number one. Number two, the, the moment, look, if you're good at something, Sajbir, never do it for free. Because yeah. if you don't value your own brand and your own product, the consumer will not. You will get that consumer briefly. Tomorrow, someone else will come and take that consumer by giving something else free. So if, if you believe you have a brand or a product or a service that is worth it, never give it for free. Never burn freebies. These guys are all, they're all disappear overnight. Perfect strike is written. Okay. So I think, uh, so yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, so Samar, uh, so thanks a lot. Uh, you know, this was super engaging, man. I mean, I'm, you know, getting a lot of private messages also that this is very, very good. And they loved hearing you. So in fact, I think, uh, you know, I need to need to connect with you and take guidance uh, from you. And uh, happy to maybe, do that. maybe as a consultant and, you know, we, ha we always have a lot of pressing issues where we need somebody of your caliber who has seen like scale. Because to be honest, for us, uh, you know, scale is like uh, it's it's every day is the newest newer scale, which is a good problem to have, but still a problem to have. So, so I should connect with you. But uh, but yeah, thanks a lot for uh, giving the time, and it was really really good to have you here. And uh, I certainly learned a lot, and I would really ping you, uh, you know, from time to time to pick your brains on things. If sure, sir, ever... thank... Absolutely. Thank you. Where are you based, uh, Samar? I'm in Chandigarh. So if you ever come oh, yes. to Chandigarh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to, yeah. well, I used to, you know, it's funny. When I was to work for Pepsi, I uh, was in Gurgaon. I used to go very often to Chandigarh. And okay. uh, even at UB, where, when I, it's a, you know, we, I would go very, very often to Punjab and Chandigarh. And I worked actually all over Punjab and Haryana as well. And I think one Punjab of the most is probably the most beer per capita. That's probably. No, that's not true. The, <laughs> that's a per, that's a commonly held belief. Actually, the per capita is probably uh, amongst the highest is in Goa, Kerala, uh, Tamil yeah, Nadu, uh, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, but yeah, it's that's the image that uh, that people have. But that's not. I, I love Kingfisher Ultra, by the way. So you know, I'm. Oh, uh, thank you, thank you. of your brand. So thanks a lot, man. Yeah, thank you, Samar. Thank you for your time, and I'm. Happy to connect with you separately. Thank you, Jungle Works, for having me over. Thank you. All the best. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, everybody. Very nice to have uh, have you all here. Thank you. Thank bye you. bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.